Good morning, friends. I'd like to warmly welcome you to this corporate worship service of Evangelical Presbyterian Church. Uh, my name is Rick Gray, and I'm a campus minister for international students at the University of Delaware. And I'd like to greet all of our Chinese friends out there a happy Lunar New Year. A lot of dumplings were consumed in the fellowship hall last night. So, if you're visiting with us this morning, please fill out a, a Connect card that's on the back of the front pew there, or the pew in front of you, rather. And uh, that will help us extend a more personal welcome to you. Now, if you've been with us uh, for the last several weeks, you know that we're in a sermon series entitled, Don't Just Go to the Church, Be the Church. And uh, last week, we heard uh, Pastor Chad preach on the first section of uh, the book of Ephesians that explains how we as Christ's church are to grow together uh, in unified love for one another. And next week, uh, Chad will be back to preach on the last section of the chapter that details what our new selves should look like as we interact with each other as members in the church. But today, my sermon focuses on those middle verses of Ephesians 4 that deal with how our Savior uh, wants our new selves to look as we interact with each other as members in the church. Um, so, with that said, uh, as you listen to the prelude, I invite you to read the reflection about the difference Jesus makes in our lives, printed on the front of your bulletin, and prepare your hearts to worship our great and glorious God. Please stand with me for the call to worship from Psalm 106. It's found on page two of your bulletin. Praise the Lord. Oh, give thanks to the Lord, for he is good. 
for his steadfast love endures forever. Blessed are they who observe justice, who do righteousness at all times. Blessed is the Lord, the God of Israel, from everlasting to everlasting. And let all the people say, Amen. Praise the Lord. Let's sing together our Father, You Are Sovereign. That's Trinity Hymnal number 75 as we worship our sovereign God whose love pursues his purpose, which is our soul's eternal good. 175, I'm so, sorry, 75. <laughs> Please join me in prayer. Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, we praise you because you are worthy of praise. You are our creator. You are our deliverer. You are our comforter. You are our source of wisdom. You are our great Jehovah. And we ask, Lord, that you would send your Holy Spirit to come and guide our attention and focus back to you. Help us to shed our concerns and worries that we might have from this past week and the week ahead to, so that we would have full presence of mind to focus on what matters most, which is you. May you be honored as you hear our voices rise to your throne room to praise you. And now let us pray as Jesus taught us to pray, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, 
hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from the evil one. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Well, for those of you who are new to our church, there's a term that you're going to hear frequently here at EP, and that term is grace. Uh, we celebrate God's grace here because everything good in our lives is owing to his grace. For example, when we were in rebellion against him, without hope in this world, God initiated to us first with his grace. It is his grace that gave us faith to believe in him the first time, and it's his grace that keeps us believing in him even till now. It is by his grace that we were legally justified before him because he canceled the debt of our sin. But what our confession of faith talks about today is a different sort of grace. It's his grace that also sanctifies us. And so what does that mean? It means that his grace works in our lives, throughout our whole lives, to change our hearts, to make us love more and more what God loves and to hate more and more what he hates. We obey him more and more in our lives. And he never stops sanctifying us until we reach glory. Or to put it another way, we are remade. He remakes us every single day to reflect more and more of his image. That's what the statement of faith, the confession of faith is uh, intended to communicate today. So let's state what we believe together. What is sanctification? Sanctification is a work of God's grace whereby they whom God has before the foundation of the world chosen to be holy are in time through the powerful operation of his spirit applying the death and resurrection of Christ unto them, renewed in their whole man after the image of God, having the seeds of repentance unto life and all other saving graces put into their hearts and those graces so stirred up, increased and strengthened as that they more and more die unto sin and rise unto newness of life. seated. The Old Testament lesson today is taken from Leviticus chapter 19, verses 1 to 18. You can follow along in your bulletin, and it's also in the Pew Bible on page 739. Leviticus chapter 19, verses 1 to 18. And the Lord spoke to Moses, saying, Speak to all the congregation of the people of Israel and say to them, You shall be holy, for I, the Lord your God, am holy. Every one of you shall revere his mother and his father, and you shall keep my Sabbaths. I am the Lord your God. Do not turn to idols or make for yourselves any god of cast metal. I am the Lord your God. When you offer a sacrifice of peace offerings to the Lord, you shall offer it so that you may be accepted. And it shall be eaten the same day you offer it, or on the day after. And that anything left over until the third day shall be burned up with fire. If it is eaten at all on the third day, it is tainted. It will not be accepted. 
And everyone who eats it shall bear his iniquity, because he has profaned what is holy to the Lord. And that person shall be cut off from his people. When you reap the harvest of your land, you shall not reap to your field right up to its edge. Neither shall you gather the gleanings after your harvest. And you shall not strip your vineyard bare. Neither shall you gather the fallen grapes of your vineyard. You shall leave them for the poor and for the sojourner. I am the Lord your God. You shall not steal. You shall not deal falsely. And you shall not lie to one another. You shall not swear by my name falsely and so profane the name of your God. I am the Lord. You shall not oppress your neighbor or rob him. The wages of a hired worker shall not remain with you all night until the morning. You shall not curse the deaf or put a stumbling block before the blind. But you shall fear your God. I am the Lord. You shall do no injustice in court. You shall not be partial to the poor or defer to the great. But in righteousness shall you judge your neighbor. You shall not go around as a slanderer among your people. And you shall not stand up against the life of your neighbor. I am the Lord. You shall not hate your brother in your heart. But you shall reason frankly with your neighbor. Lest you incur sin because of him. You shall not take vengeance or bear a grudge against the sons of your own people, but you shall love your neighbor as yourself. I am the Lord. This is the word of the Lord. Thank you. I just want to pause for a moment and uh, focus on the first two verses of that passage that Bill just read to us. It says, And the Lord spoke to Moses, saying, Speak to all the congregation of the people of Israel and say to them, You shall be holy, for I, the Lord, your God, am holy. You know, when we take a sober look at our own lives, when we are honest with ourselves, we have to admit that we have not been holy as our God is holy. We haven't even been close Instead of following his wisdom, we follow our own counsel. Instead of submitting to his rule, we, in our lives, we try to control our own lives. We get angry when we should be patient. We, we think thoughts that dishonor him. We say words that hurt his people. But here's the good news. In him, there is forgiveness for every sin. Through Christ, there is forgiveness for every sin, past, present, and future. Through faith in Christ, there is no limit to his love. There's no limit to his forgiveness. It means that you can do nothing to tempt him to forsake you or to leave you. And that incredible love, God has demonstrated by his son dying on the cross for us. And, and here's the thing. When we understand God's forgiveness, it doesn't encourage us to sin more when his great love dawns on our hearts and melts our hearts, what do we want to do? We love him more. We want to follow him harder. We, we love what he loves and we hate what he hates. And so the power to overcoming sin in your life is not beating yourself up. It's not making yourself feel guilty. It's not trying to barter a deal with God that you're going to do better next time. What is it? It's simply confessing your sin before him and receiving his free grace that came at the price of his son's life. That's what we're going to do now. We're going to do that here corporately together as we state the confession of sin. And then that will be followed by uh, a time of silence for you to confess your sins privately before the Lord. Let's, let's, let's confess our sins now corporately. Lord, though you should guide us, we inform ourselves. Though you should rule us. We control ourselves. Though you should fulfill us, we console ourselves. We think your truth too high, your will too hard, your power too remote, your love too free, but they are not. And without them, we are of all people most miserable. Now heal our confused minds with your word. Heal our divided wills with your law. Heal our troubled consciences with your love. Heal our anxious hearts with your presence. 
all for the sake of your son who loved us and gave himself up with us. Now, Lord, hear the confession of your people. Thank you, Jesus, that because of your gracious, steadfast love toward us, you will never leave us to perish in our sins. Your death was payment for our feelings, and your mercy is always more than we need. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Now hear the assurance of pardon from Psalm 130. O Israel, hope in the Lord. For with the Lord there is steadfast love, and with him is plentiful redemption. And he will redeem Israel from all his iniquities. Amen. Well, every week we set aside time in our worship service. We continue in our worshiping by talking about our mission, why we exist as a church. And we believe that God placed EP here in New York, Delaware to change lives who share in Christ. That's our, that's our mission. And you can read more about how our mission and how we live that out on page 11. If you would, uh, please turn with me to page 11 and read along with me. There's a number of things that are listed in there. And here's the thing. I don't have time to go through all of them, but they're all important. So please take the time every week to read through what's listed here. But there are a couple things I want to point out. First of all, the church-wide potluck supper is tonight starting at 5. It's going to be a lot of fun. It's going to be a lot of good food. So if this is the first time you're hearing about it, please come. You feel free to, to make a dish if you want to, but the most important thing is your presence. Please come, and it's going to be a great time of night. Secondly, we are resuming fellowship groups as part of Sunday celebration on February 5th. And so I encourage you, if you are not part of a small group Bible study or a small group discipleship group, um, please pray about joining a life group here. And we're placing people uh, that, uh, that don't have a life group or fellowship group right now. We're placing them in fellowship groups now. Um, you can email me. My email's on the back of the bulletin. Or if you look on the Connect card, just fill out the Connect card and give your information and just state that you want to be connected in a fellowship group. I will contact you personally and get you set up in one. Um, the, uh, the last thing I want to cover is send. Um, we... Um, we send ourselves and others into the community and the world to make an impact for Christ. And there are a number of ways that we do that. Uh, as many of you know, today is Sanctity of Life Sunday. It is um, a day, churches across the nation set aside today to bring awareness to the sanctity, the, the sanctity of life. Okay, The scriptures teach that all life matters. Life from when you're conceived in your mother's womb, that life matters. Life matters outside the womb until you are in your grave. God cares about life. And that's why we, we remind ourselves every year of that important truth taught in our scriptures. But we also partner with two organizations because we believe in the sanctity of life. The first organization we partner with is an organization called A Door of Hope Pregnancy Center. This, uh, this is, a, um, this is a, a nonprofit organization that provides medical, licensed medical services and counseling to women who are facing very difficult decisions because of unexpected pregnancies. So if you want to find out more information, you can find that on our website. Um, but we not only care about life in the womb, but also life outside the womb. And that's why we partner with an organization called Sunday Breakfast Mission. Sunday Breakfast Mission, it, it, it exists to serve the homeless, the addicted, the impoverished through Christ-centered programs that meet their spiritual, social, and their physical needs. Annually, Sunday Breakfast Mission provides over 300,000 meals and over 55,000 nights of lodging to men, women, and children 
And so how can you get involved in this organization? Well, from today until February 12th, the diaconate is going to be sponsoring a collection drive for sheets, pillows, and more. And so during this time, they're going to be collecting donations for this. And so here's how you can participate in this. Um, they're asking for donation, not of anything, but of specific items they're requesting down to the item, the brand, and the color. Okay, so you can find out more information two different ways. Go into our website on the on the front page of our website. You can f just scroll down a little bit, and you'll find directions, links. You can click there to donate. But also, if you don't want to wait that long, you can go to the back table in the narthex, right beside the entry doors, and there's a donation table there that you can put your your donations, or there's information sheets that you can you can pull to give you more information about that. Um, one more thing I want to mention about that Sunday breakfast mission is the de one deacon came to me this morning just very grateful uh, for Mar Margot Asmansky's suggestion to get involved in that. So please uh, thank her for, uh, for turning the deacons on to that effort. Uh, the last sin to ministry that I want to mention is it has to do with our youth ministry. Okay, Our youth is getting more involved in impacting the community by organizing a Shoe Middle School outreach. Shoe Middle School is right down the road, just a couple of miles. And so our youth ministry is partnering with Young Life to start a twice a month meeting on Thursdays from 2 to 4 p.m. And they just need three to five volunteers to do any of the following things, uh, any of the following activities. Organizing games, serving food, leading a devotional, tutoring middle school students. So if you can do all of them or one of them, um, please consider volunteering. Uh, you only need to make five two-hour meetings between uh, February through June. So it's not a high commitment. And if you're interested in more, finding out more about this ministry, Micah Freer and Ben Mallory are going to be located in the Narthex after the service to tell you more details about that. Okay. Last thing I want to mention is um, today we celebrate by introducing new members to our congregation. And so when I call your names, please come up to the front. And yeah, there's room enough up here to stand with me. Come on up to the stage and stand with me here as I call your name. Uh, Jean, Jean Bundes, Teresa Franklin, Tom Freeman, Russell and Margot Osmansky, Sandy Shidner, Roslyn Sutherland, Dan and Packy, uh, Patty Tucker. And as they're making their way to the front, let me just say a couple of words of why they're taking this important step toward membership. There's, there's a couple of reasons why membership is important. The first reason is that uh, these, these people, they, they want to make a public statement that they, they don't only want to be consumers of the church, but they want to be contributors to, to the church and God's kingdom. Okay, they want to be stakeholders, and that's really important. That's the statement they're making up here. The second one, it doesn't get talked about uh, enough. Um, the scriptures teach us that our obedience to Christ, um, uh, out of obedience to him, we should join a local church. Uh, Hebrews 13, 17 teaches that Christians must submit themselves to the authority of the local church, which is precisely what membership is. And so I encourage you, if you have... If you haven't joined, um, please give me a call, email me. I'd be happy to talk to you more about joining the church. And so uh, there are five membership vows, which we've all talked about and talked through before. And so I'm going to state each vow, and if you would affirm them just by saying, I do. Do you acknowledge yourself to be a sinner in the sight of God, justly deserving his displeasure and without hope, except in his sovereign mercy, do you? I do. Do you believe in the Lord Jesus Christ as the Son of God and Savior of sinners? And do you receive and rest upon him alone for salvation as he is offered in the gospel, do you? Do you now resolve and promise in humble reliance upon the grace of the Holy Spirit that you will endeavor to live as becomes the followers of Christ, do you? I do. 
Do you promise to support the church in its worship and work to the best of your ability? And do you submit yourself to the government and discipline of the church and promise to study its purity and peace? I do. Okay. Please remain up here. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to pray for you guys. But before I do, I just want to make a, a brief announcement. Uh, Doug Gray, Lowell Gray's son, um, had a heart attack. I believe it was last is this past week, and he's in the hospital. So um, I'm going to incorporate praying for Doug and, and his family in my prayer. So please join me in prayer. Lord, we come to you thanking you because you are the one that bestows grace on all of us. You are the giver of every good gift that we have. You are a comforter. You are a deliverer. You are also our healer. And so, Lord, we pray for Doug as he is in the hospital right now. Lord, we pray that you would work your healing mercies in his body and uh, help him to recover. Lord, be with his family as they are uh, just wrestling through a very difficult situation. And Lord, we also pray for a Door of Hope Pregnancy Center. We pray that you would bless it with medical staff and counselors to help women who are facing difficult decisions with, because of unexpected pregnancies. We thank you for the many lives that have been saved through that ministry. We also thank you for Sunday Breakfast Mission as you have uh, ministered to obviously thousands and thousands of people through that ministry. Lord, I pray that they are greatly encouraged by all the donations that they receive to help them carry out their mission. Lord, I thank you for the youth ministry and their, this new endeavor to outreach to SHU Middle School. Lord, please bless their efforts and may they be greatly encouraged with the people who step forward to uh, fill in the gap and to, to minister to youth. And I pray that through this effort, uh, teenagers would come to know you as their Lord and Savior. And Lord, I thank you for these uh, new members. Lord, may they feel welcomed at our church and that they would build deep and strong friendships in our body. I pray that they would grow to understand their giftedness and understand how they can, can use their gifts to contribute to the body and also press your mission forward and your kingdom forward through using their gifts. I pray that EP would be a great blessing to them, that they would um, grow in the knowledge of your grace and your mercy toward them and be able to minister to others in that same mercy and grace. And Lord, in all of it, may they glorify you. And, and Lord, as we turn our attention to your word this morning in Ephesians, I pray that you would work through your servant Rick and that the grace that, that has been ministered to him, I pray that he would speak clearly and proclaim your mercy and your grace for all of us so that we will, we will cherish it in our hearts. May it change us on the spot in this room through the power of your Holy Spirit. Use him, Lord, as your mouthpiece. And we pray all this in Jesus' name. Amen. You can be seated. We uh, continue on in, in worship through our tithes and offerings. And we, and we give for a couple of different reasons. Uh, the first reason is that the resources that you give through your generosity, we carry out the mission of this church, and we could not do it without your generosity. But there's a second reason that is probably even more important than that. We are generous toward God because he has been generous toward us. He spared nothing, not, uh, not even the blood of his son to be generous toward us, to make us rich in him. And that's, that's the reason why we give. And so let's go to the Lord one more time in prayer. Jesus, as we present to you your tithe and offerings, may what we give back to you be a demonstration of our gratitude for what you've so generously given to us. May it be used to further your kingdom, to help the poor, and take your gospel message to the ends of the earth. And we pray all this in your name. Amen.
for our next song, uh, King of Love. I believe it's the first time we've ever played it here. And so what we're going to ask you is for you to remain seated as the, uh, as the band teaches this to us for the first time. And then they're going to ask us to stand and join them in worship after that. You may be seated. We 
We have a great and good shepherd indeed. Turn with me in your Bibles, if you will, to Ephesians chapter 4, verses 17 to 24. They can be found in your pew Bible, uh, page 1244. We're going to look at Ephesians chapter 4, verses 17 to 24. Hear now the reading of God's holy inspired word. Paul writes, Now this I say and testify in the Lord, that you must no longer walk as the Gentiles do in the futility of their minds. They are darkened in their understanding, alienated from the life of God because of the ignorance that is in them due to the hardness of their heart. They have become callous and given themselves up to sensuality, greedy to practice every kind of impurity. But that is not the way you learn Christ, assuming that you have heard about him and were taught in him, as the truth is in Jesus, to put off your old self, which belongs to your former manner of life and is corrupt through deceitful desires, and to be renewed in the spirit of your minds, and to put on the new self, created after the likeness of God in true righteousness and holiness. The grass withers, the flower fades, but the word of our God will stand forever. Let's pray together. O Lord, We have learned Christ, but we need to learn so much more of our Savior and the truth that is in Jesus if we are to grow more deeply in love with you and more passionate about living for you. So please teach us now. Speak to our hearts and minds by the power of your Holy Spirit for your glory and the world's good, I pray. In Christ's name, amen. Well, I'd like to begin my sermon by addressing any possible misunderstanding about the title, which is Out with the Old, In with the New. Let me be clear. I'm not trying to get rid of the older folks in the church. For having recently become eligible for Medicare myself, I too would have to leave the congregation. But while I'm on the subject of uh, old age, did you hear about the grandfather who showed off an old photograph of his parents to his young grandson? He told the boy, these are your great grandparents. Do you think you look like them? And the five-year-old looked at the picture and shook his head and said, not yet. <laughs> anyway, as you may have noticed during the scripture reading, the sermon title actually refers to how the followers of Jesus are called to put off the old self and put on our new self. And as anyone who has followed Christ for any length of time knows, while these two commands are easy to say, they are way harder to do. Still, in, in these verses of Ephesians 4, the Apostle Paul, under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit and with a heart full of love for Jesus, exhorts us in the way that we should grow in God's likeness. If I can summarize what I think the Spirit intends to impress upon us from this passage, it is that the truth in Jesus must be central to the way we think and live. Let me repeat that. The truth in Jesus must be central to the way we think 
and live. And as this happens, this truth does three main things for us. First, the truth in Jesus reveals the tragedy of unbelief. Second, the truth in Jesus calls us to put off the old man. And thirdly, the truth in Jesus calls us to put on the new self. First then, the truth in Jesus reveals the tragedy of unbelief. In the first three verses of our passage, verses 17 to 19, Paul paints an awful picture about the dreadful state of people's lives who don't know Christ. In verse 17, he warns us, Now this I say, and testify in the Lord, that you must no longer walk as the Gentiles do in the futility of their minds. So the apostle begins by emphasizing the importance of his exhortation with the words, and I testify in the Lord, or as the NIV translates the phrase, and I insist in the Lord. In other words, listen up, you Ephesian believers. This isn't just me writing off of the top of my head. No, take these words with utmost seriousness because they come with the authority of our Lord Jesus himself. And what's so critical for the Ephesian church as well as for EP Church this morning to heed? Paul continues in verse 17. That you must no longer walk as the Gentiles do in the futility of their minds. The Greek word translated walk is a biblical metaphor for our conduct in everyday life. In fact, Paul uses this Greek word, peripateo, yes, I went to seminary, um, seven times in his letter to the Ephesians. But to give us a better modern English understanding, the NIV translates the word as live. Our Lord doesn't want us to live like the Gentiles, who in this context represent the entire unbelieving world, whose minds and thinking are an exercise in futility. That is, they never lead to anything of lasting significance or eternal value. Rather, their way of thinking is at best worthless and at worst harmful. And why is the thinking of unbelievers so bad? Are they not capable of solving significant human problems? Discovering cures for terrible diseases, creating beautiful pieces of art, and making many other valuable contributions to society? Of course they are. But their serious problem is that none of their great accomplishments and distinguished awards can advance the glorious kingdom of Christ by even one inch. While our unbelieving friends may gain great fame and fortune in this temporary visible world, they lose everything in the eternal unseen world. For Paul goes on in verse 18 to lament that those who don't know Christ, he says, are darkened in their understanding, alienated from the life of God because of the ignorance that is in them due to the hardness of their heart. Unbelievers may be incredibly bright and shed all sorts of light on all manner of subjects, but when it comes to the subject that matters far and away the most, they are dim-witted and fumbling around in the dark 
separated from God who made them, sustains them, and came to rescue them. This is because they're ignorant of our Savior who declared, I am the light of the world. And they only have themselves to blame for their wretched condition, which is, Paul says, due to the hardness of their hearts. In a similar way, Paul made the same charge against the ungodly in Romans chapter 1, verse 21, where he moaned, for although they knew God, they did not honor him as God or give thanks to him, but they became futile in their thinking, and their foolish hearts were darkened. In other words, those who ignore God fail to see how completely dependent they are upon him every moment of their lives. Then Paul sums up the dire and des desperate condition of those who live for themselves and not for their creator in verse 19 by concluding, they have become callous and have given themselves up to sensuality, greedy to practice every kind of impurity. The Greek word translated callous here only appears one time in the entire Bible, just in this verse 19. It refers to those who cannot feel pain, or as the NIV translates it, those who have lost all sensitivity. And as one commentator says, the perfect tense suggests that they have reached this point, presumably after a period of rejecting God and his ways, and now there is a hard, impenetrable shell that renders them insensitive to God and describes their ongoing condition. What a tragic state to be in. But it explains why those who have rejected God have given themselves up to sensuality. These spiritually callous ones foolishly try to live, try to fill, that is, God, their God-shaped vacuum deep within their souls with any and every worldly pleasure they can indulge themselves in, whatever may soothe their physical senses. This includes all manner of immoral living as they indulge themselves in the seven deadly sins of lust, gluttony, greed, laziness, anger, envy, and pride, as well as every other sin under the sun. However, it also includes the misuse of God's good gifts as they make things like family, health, education, wealth, career, material possessions, leisure, and more, the objects of their worship. Finally, Paul writes, these pitiful souls are, in his words, greedy to practice every kind of impurity, which to my ears is an awkward expression. But a commentator helps clarify this ESV translation in these words. He says, this term, often translated greed or covetousness, indicates that such people are never satisfied with what they have. In other words, they seek to satisfy every type of dirty desire with an insatiable hunger for more. Dear friends, what a tragically sad description of utterly wasted lives. Yet the appalling truth of the 21st century unbelieving Western world is just as tragic if not more so than the tragedy of the first century's unbelieving Gentile world. Since its debut in 2005, the Emmy Award-winning TV show Intervention has chronicled real-life stories about addiction in the United States. 
in one heart-wrenching episode, a pretty young pre-med student named Allison was on her way to becoming a surgeon when traumatic events and academic pressure lured her to seek relief through inhalants. By the time Allison appeared on the show Intervention, she was inhaling 12 aerosol cans of computer dust remover a day. Because she was focused 24-7 on getting high, the bright aspiring doctor's grades cratered, and Allison had to drop out of Boston College just three weeks before graduation. Can you imagine the futility of a mind whose sole obsession and purpose in life is the fleeting pleasure afforded by abusing a can of dust remover? Thankfully, Allison eventually beat her addiction, and she is sober now. But sadly, her spiritual understanding seems to remain just as dark as when she was still an addict. And as far as we know, Allison still remains alienated from a life with God. You see, dear friends, the truth in Jesus is that it doesn't matter if you're wasting your life becoming high or wasting your life becoming successful. What matters is do you know that Jesus is God who became man to live the perfect life we could never live and offer that life as a perfect sacrifice upon the cross for all our rebel thoughts, words, and deeds and rose from the grave to offer new, abundant, and eternal life to everyone who will embrace him as their Savior and Lord. For this truth in Jesus makes all the difference in the world between those who believe in him and those who do not. So what about you and what about me this morning? Does any of this ring true to your own life experience? Do we believe the truth in Jesus or don't we? Do you have a personal relationship with the living God of the universe by faith in Christ? Or are you separated from God? Ignorant of how totally dependent upon him you are for even your next breath. This lamentable litany in verses 17 to 19 of those whose hard hearts lead them to seek satisfaction everywhere but in our sweet Savior who alone can truly satisfy our deepest longings is an apt description of me for my first 23 spiritually dark years of my life. No doubt, the same is true for many of you. Whether you were raised in a home devoid of God or in a home that was devoted to God. But if you don't know God, the truth in Jesus should scare you to death, but also warm your heart to life, drive you to your knees, and move you to cry out to him to rescue you from yourself. Please know that nothing 
delights and glorifies our Savior more than to give you an abundant life in him. And if you already have life with Jesus, then our response should be appreciation, not arrogance. Compassion, not contempt. And devotion, not disobedience. This brings us to our second point, which is the truth in Jesus calls us to put off our old self. For we were taught in Christ, as verse 22 says, to put off your old self, which belongs to your former manner of life and is corrupt through deceitful desires. Here the phrase, old self, refers to who we were before we came, became to believe in Jesus. That is, our former unbelieving manner of life without God. But our old self also refers to our sinful nature that continues to plague us even though we now know Christ and are alive to God. For there would be no need to command us to take off something that was no longer clinging to us, would there? Yet this is the great problem of every true follower of Jesus. Our old self stubbornly clings to us. So as one commentator points out, this verse is calling us to an ongoing process of complete repentance. For the metaphor of taking off and putting on that Paul employs in these verses alludes to our habit of shedding our dirty clothes at the end of each day and donning a new set of clean clothes every day. This means that every day of our lives, we should be repenting of our old self and re-embracing our new self. Indeed, as the Spirit convicts us, we should be growing in repenting many times throughout every day. But I need to say that this daily putting off our old self this ongoing process of repenting, this habitual dying to our sinful tendencies is impossible in our own strength. For as the, Paul, uh, the Apostle Paul confessed in Romans chapter 7, and I read, I do not understand my actions, for I do not do what I want, but I do the very thing I hate. For I have the desire to do what is right, but not the ability to carry it out. For I do not do the good I want, but the evil I do not want is what I keep on doing. For I delight in the law of God in my inner being, but I see my members, in my members, another law waging war against the law of my mind and making me captive to the law of sin that dwells in my members. Wretched man that I am. Who will deliver me from this body of death? And the apostle answers, thanks be to God through Jesus Christ our Lord. So even the great apostle had to continually put off his old self, which is the culprit behind his and all our struggles to stay true to our Lord Jesus. For as long as we live in these fallen bodies, our old self wages war against our new self. That God, through the Spirit of Christ, is mercifully and mightily fashioning in us. Now all the godless characteristics previously listed in verses 17 to 19 describe our old self. But verse 22 adds another old self characteristic that is vital for us to understand. This is that our old self is 
corrupt through deceitful desires. This, that is endemic to our sinful nature, our desires, passions, cravings that delude us into thinking that if we just indulge such wrong impulses, then we'll be happy, satisfied, or fulfilled. So Paul wisely reminds us that these desires are lying to us and cannot be trusted. They promise life, but lead to death. They tempt with sweetness, but leave a bitter aftertaste. They seduce with pleasure, but end in pain. For as the saying goes, sin will take you farther than you want to go, keep you longer than you want to stay, and cost you more than you ever want to pay. You may have heard the adage, dress for success. This old advice teaches us the way we dress will influence the way others perceive and treat us. If you show up for a job interview wearing a pair of sweatpants and a t-shirt, you're less likely to get hired than that guy over there wearing a suit and tie. In fact, one research study actually showed that even our shoes, even our shoes can reveal something about our personality, our politics, our status, our age, and our income. Don't look down. <laughs> Yet not only do the, shoe, the clothes we wear affect the way we are perceived, another study demonstrated that our clothes also affect the way we perform. And this study concluded that what we wear can affect our thinking, negotiating skills, as well as, get this, our hormone levels and our heart rate, just by what you wear. Now, if the selection of our physical clothes is important, how much more important for Christians must be the selection of our spiritual clothes? So my friends, when was the last time you took off that nasty old self? You do realize that it influences the way others perceive and treat you, even more than whatever clothes you may be wearing. That critical spirit, that selfishness, those harsh words, the bitterness, the hard heart, the arrogant attitude, they don't look good on you or on me. Nor do these and all the other vestiges of our old self do us any good. And they certainly don't help advance the cause of Christ in and through us. So let us wisely heed the apostles' inspired command to put off our old self and confront our lying lusts by telling them the truth that indulging in their temptations is futile. It will betray our Savior Jesus, deaden our sensitivity to the Spirit, break our intimacy with God, and hinder our growth in grace. And this brings us to our last point, which is the truth in Jesus calls us to put on the new self. For we're also taught in Christ, as verse 24 says, to put on the new self, created after the likeness of God in true righteousness and holiness. Here the phrase new self refers to the new identity that the Spirit graciously bestowed upon us when we were born again into a new, eternal, and abundant life with God by faith in Jesus 
as our magnificent Redeemer King. So as we take off our nasty old self, we put on our true new self. And notice, this clothing was created in the image of our great and glorious God. For just as God first created Adam and Eve in his own likeness, and even though our divine character was terribly scarred by the fall of our first parents, the Lord of heaven and earth is recreating his image in each of his beloved children who are members of the body of Christ. Our new self reflects God's glory as it's summarized by two of his familiar primary qualities, his righteousness and his holiness. For the Bible often couples these overlapping divine attributes to epitomize the good, beautiful, and true lives that God's image bearers are meant to radiate. Righteousness just points to doing what's right, while holiness points to separating ourselves from what's wrong. So just as Elder Zinkin read in Leviticus 19, God called his Old Testament people to be holy because he is holy. Here in Ephesians 4, God calls his New Testament people to be holy as well. This means that our new self is respectful, worshipful, compassionate, generous, honest, merciful, fair, and every other character quality that flows out of a life of love for God and love for our neighbors. Yet the big question is, how do we continually take off our old self and put on our new self? Well, the apostle provides us with the answers in verses 20, 21, and 23. First, in verse 20, Paul writes, but that is not the way you learn Christ. This contrasts our old self with what we learned that forever changed our lives, or more correctly, who we learned that forever changed our lives. Now, we might have expected Paul's words to say, the way you have learned about Christ. But instead, he omits the, prepos the preposition to emphasize that to put on our new self, we must first enter into a personal relationship with Jesus. We must know him, not just know about him. Not just understand a set of facts about the man from Galilee. Still, this doesn't mean that learning about the historical reality of our Savior's life, death, resurrection, and ascension aren't important. For this is why the apostle writes in verse 21, assuming that you have heard about him and were taught in him as the truth is in Jesus. Obviously, before we can know Christ, we must first hear about him. And before we can follow our Savior's teaching, we must learn what he taught. So how do we know the truth is in Jesus? Well, by reading, praying over, studying, memorizing, and obeying the Bible, the Holy Scriptures which Jesus insisted are all about him. From cover to cover, from Genesis to Revelation, and all the other 64 books in between. Surely, we especially know our Savior in the four Gospels of the New Testament. But Luke reports in his Gospel that as the resurrected Jesus walked with his two disciples on the Emmaus Road, 
Beginning with Moses and all the prophets, he interpreted to them in all the scriptures the things concerning himself. So we can learn much about Christ in the Old Testament too. And for the church in Ephesus, the easiest way for them to learn the truth that is in Jesus was just by reading what Paul had already written to them in the first three chapters of his letter and which we've already been taught in this sermon series. Then the last part of the answer to how we put on our new self is found in, verses tw- in verse 23, where the apostle writes, and to be renewed in the spirit of your minds. While many commentators and English Bible translations think Paul was referring to the human spirit or attitude of our minds, I'm personally persuaded by those who believe he was actually pointing to the Holy Spirit. For the Spirit of God illuminates and renews our minds as we read the pages of God's Word. And this is why, if we're to put on the new self, then you and I need to be in the Bible every day. For this is the primary way God renews and cleanses our minds from all the lies that continually bombard our hearts, whether they come from our unruly sinful desires or from an unbelieving world's latest tempting distractions. Dear friends, if you and I are to daily take off our old self and put on our new self, then the truth in Jesus must be central to the way we think and live. And the central truth of Jesus is the good news about him. So as I close, Let me preach the good news to you and myself once again. It is that the living God of the universe knows everything about you, past, present, and future. He knows your darkest sins. He knows your deepest shame. But if you love Jesus, it's because he first loved you. And God's love for you is infinitely more passionate, powerful, devoted, determined, unfathomable, unshakable, and unending than yours will ever be for him this side of heaven. And that is why you were the apple of his eye before the world began. Why he sent his only son to die for you on that horrific cross. Why he poured out his spirit to make you alive with him by faith in Jesus. Adopted you as his beloved son and daughter and will continue fashioning you into his image until one fine day you will be welcomed by our Savior's passionate embrace in glory. Beloved, the truth in Jesus is that no matter what you have done, good, bad, indifferent, your Father is always for you. in every and any situation that your life is called to go through. He will never let you go. You mean that much to him. Read an article, starts out, I was adopted from Ho Chi Minh City, Vietnam at the age of three wrote Levi. The young teenager continued, adoption has changed my life 
physically and spiritually and has shown me a great picture of how Christians have been adopted into God's family at salvation. Physically, being in a family meant my basic needs were fully provided, such as nutritious food, regular medical care, clothing that fit properly, and having my own toothbrush. My first pair of shoes was so special that I would wear them all day, every day. I wouldn't even take them off in the shower. In the orphanage, older kids would steal from younger kids. So I got into the habit of standing on my toys because I was afraid that someone would take them from me. That's why I wore my shoes everywhere and refused to take them off. Spiritually, adoption brought me into a Christian home. My adoptive parents made a commitment to love, support, and teach me, even though I wasn't their own. Raising children who've been through difficult situations takes a lot of commitment, sacrifice, and patience. I think adoption is committing to raise a child like he is your own and showing him the love of Christ through modeling his attributes. Jesus is the perfect example of what com true commitment and sacrifice look like. He laid down his life for us, which was the ultimate sacrifice, and promises to all believers that he will never leave us nor forsake us, which shows us his commitment. Earthly adoption is a picture of spiritual adoption, in that when you get saved, you become part of the family of God. Our status changes to sons and daughters. With this new identity comes new purpose and meaning. As sons and daughters of God, we will partake in his future inheritance in the kingdom of God. And as the Apostle Paul teaches in Ephesians, God does for us what we could never do for ourselves. Adoption will always be special to me because it changed my life. Brothers and sisters in Christ, when the God of all creation adopted you into his beloved family, he gave you a new self, a new purpose, a new destiny. Like young Levi, revel in your father's love, the truth that is in Jesus, and the power of the Spirit. Preach this glorious gospel every day to yourself and to all those you meet along the way. Make it central to the way you think and live. Let's pray together. Our Father in heaven, we don't have words that are adequate to thank you for the love you have lavished upon us as your adopted sons and daughters. But your love that we see and experience in your Son and our Savior Jesus by the power of your Spirit moves us to thank you with our lives. So to this good end, please help your children to make the truth of Jesus ever more central to the way we think and live so that you may be honored and your kingdom advanced. These things we pray in the mighty and merciful name of Christ. Amen. As our hymn of response, let's stand and sing to that Jesus in whom we have new life.
rejoice in my Redeemer, greatest treasure, wellspring of my soul. I will trust in Him, no other. My soul is satisfied in Him. of God and Jesus Christ, lift up your heads and receive the Lord's benediction. May the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God our Father and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you all so that you may continue to take off the old self, put on the new self to the glory and praise of our Lord. Amen.